Okay, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. So, before I begin with the formal uh, presentation in this session, I basically wanted to tell you uh, a couple of things that uh, one is you know when we uh, so far in this particular course, many of you may already have been teaching this course or intend to teach it uh, in the near future etcetera. So, the, uh, the idea you know that uh, most of us have been having is to sort of you know share with you uh, some of the uh, you know aspects that we have been covering in the courses in, in the course uh, that we uh, you know teach in IIT Bombay. Now, whatever I am I know presented uh, so far is uh, based on I uh, you know it is a brief uh, you know uh, part of what I have been teaching over the years as part of the environmental studies course in IIT Bombay. So, there are you know a few dimensions that I have attempted to cover one is to begin to so sort of sensitize the students we begin by looking at telling them that why do we need to look at environment. So, because you know economic activities are prevalent all over and uh, there is a link a strong link between economic activities and the environment that is why we are looking at it. Then we said you know since we are an emerging economy or developing economy so are several other countries which are also in the process of development it is important to understand how a different pathways for development can affect your environment differently. So, then we try to see what exactly is an ideal mix for based on experience of India as well as other countries. And then you know thirdly we try to look at is it possible for us to you know get into or embark on this path of sustainable development. So, here again we try to understand the concept first and then try to see how exactly it is being done elsewhere etcetera. Then we try to see how it to operationalize sustainable development in an emerging economy like India that is what we saw yesterday. No, but entire thing also crucial depends on what is the role of government. It is simply one of planning and formulating and then leaving it there or actually also play a very important role. So, when it comes to a public good like pollution or you know public utilities management etcetera government intend to play you know ends up in playing a very important role almost across the world. In that situation what happens what kind of role they can play that is exactly what I attempted to do, talk to you in the in the forenoon today where we talked about various policy options especially with respect to controlling emissions. And I guess if you are able to you know speak on some of these aspects uh, pretty well. Uh, with as a part of this course with your students they will get motivated enough to learn and also get uh, sensitized. And of course, uh, you have complete freedom to modify uh, to suit your uh, student requirement uh, and the like and this also sort of by and large covers what the UGC wants from certain aspects. So, then what am I going to do now? So, what I thought is giving having got this opportunity and number of you may also be doing uh, not simply teaching, but also maybe interested in doing some research and share some insights from what uh, you know you have been doing or others have been doing. I also thought I will share with you some insight that I derived from my own research. Now, where do I fit in in terms of this uh, you know if you go by the nomenclature of the course outline given by uh, the uh, UGC you know in a corner they talked about what is called climate change. One of the important dimensions you know that has happened in the last uh, you know uh, two decades where awareness about you know climate change has taken place almost uh, you know across the globe in variety of countries. Now, what happens with climate change? Climate change do we call it endogenous or exogenous? So, by and large although anthropogenic, anthropogenic changes will also activities will also influence climate change by and large we take climate change as exogenous to the system that is something that is outside of the control of economic activity. It may have been triggered caused by the economic activity themselves of many countries in the world, but we still look at it as something which happens outside the control outside the realm or control of the government or the policy maker or the uh, you know various economic actors in different countries. So, having said that, but climate you know exposes puts additional burden on the people because it results in disasters it basically makes sure that people are getting used to it exposes people to various extreme events floods or droughts for example. It also you know sort of uh, makes people who are already poor and vulnerable more vulnerable 
then it also poses several challenges for people to have adequate adaptation strategies, prepare themselves to adapt to changing requirements. This is not to say that you know people in India or other countries have not been adapting themselves because if you look at the farmers for instance, farmers in India, they have been very, very adaptive to all the changes that have been changes in monsoon pattern, changes in I mean rainfall pattern, changes in seasons, uh, frequent changes in terms of temperature, precipitation, etc. People are very alert. They may not be highly qualified or educated, but still they respond. They, they understand and they respond pretty well. And it is not now, it is historically they have been adapting to all this. We may not have documented all this uh, pretty well. But how do people adapt when there is, when the disaster starts, when there are extreme events? How exactly they react? Does it really help them to cope with, are these adaptations, you know, uh, practiced better by people who are more vulnerable than the others? Uh, is there any difference in the adaptation strategy itself across the nation, across nations? Are some of the things that have been going on ever since, you know, intergovernmental inter panel on climate change started looking at number of this, uh, you know, through the working groups, etc. So, I have attended some of this IPCC as well as UNFCCC meetings, I presented India in a couple of these meetings and also been part of, you know, government team to review as well as, uh, you know, discuss and prepare documentation, India's national communication to United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Since 2002, I have been engaged in preparing the uh, draft, uh, etc. here. So, therefore, based on, the, and no, but that prompted me to sort of, you know, even encourage some research scholars to take up this agenda for the PhD and some projects also I carried out uh, in this. So, in the process, I thought uh, I have few publications. So, I thought in addition to what I have been wanting to talk to you and wanting you to talk to your students also about, I also would like to share with you people about uh, some of the aspects of this research, uh, the, risk, uh, the research that I have been taking, I have been undertaking. And uh, in case you are interested, you can also take it up or you no, know, in case you think it is appropriate, you can also up, uh, introduce uh, in, a, in an appropriate fashion to uh, your students. So, this of course, I will give you complete uh, flexibility on that. So, it is in that light, I thought I will present this to you in about next, you know, 30 minutes or so, then we will take it up for discussion. So, what is that in store? Basically, I am trying to see, uh, we, the whole idea is to sort of understand disaster risk reduction, which has become major uh, aspect now in many countries and adaptation. And the whole insight that I am drawing here is based on some cases, which also give you an idea how exactly we go about doing research with respect to this. Now, I begin by giving a quotation by uh, Abramovitz, which says, while we cannot do away with natural hazards, we can definitely eliminate those we cause minimize those we exacerbate and reduce our vulnerability to most. That sums up most of the points. While we cannot do away with natural hazards, we can definitely eliminate those who cause it. Our actions, what is saying, eliminate the actions. Minimize those we exacerbate and also reduce our vulnerability to most. So, doing this requires healthy and resilient communities and as well as ecosystems. So, viewed in this light, disaster mitigation is clearly part of a broader strategy of sustainable development, making communities and nations socially, economically as well as ecologically sustainable. So, basically this is exactly what is being attempted and in number of places. So, this is what I thought is a very, very useful quotation. I thought I will share uh, this uh, with you. So, keeping this in mind, let me make a brief presentation about how do we understand climate change. Climate change has actually basically a new dimensions. Disaster, disaster risk has been there for historically for several years. Exposure has also been there for various events. Floods and droughts are not unknown to our economy, it is also known to other countries also. Now, uh, there, there have been instances of famines and others in India even historically. So, the climate change basically now exposes us to new dimensions with respect to disaster risk, exposure, vulnerability of populations and regions as well as to resilience. Now, as a result, disaster risk reduction, 
risk management, risk transfer, all have become very, very important. So, the three dimension. How do we help people to transfer the risk? How do they manage the risk? How do societies manage the risk? And how do we help them to reduce the risk also? All the very important dimensions where research on climate change have gone about. Again, people talk about two aspects here. One is to adapt to climate change, other one is to cope with these events. So, then they start debating about coping versus adaptation. Which is more important to cope with it or to adapt it? It is highly debatable. So, that is also very well established literature now. There are a lot of literature on you know, coping with climate change and also with respect to adaptation to climate change. Then they also discussion about extreme events versus extreme impacts. Events may be extreme, but they may not have much of an impact. Events may not be that extreme, but sometimes the impacts are very, very extreme. So, we make a distinction between extreme events as well as extreme impacts. A lot of research have also gone into these dimensions. After doing that, after understanding climate change with respect to each of these dimensions, then people look at determinants of risk. In fact, in terms of risk, they say by and large depends on the exposure as well as the vulnerability. So, the more vulnerable the population is and more exposed they are, the risk is very high and the vice versa. So, then you know if we ourselves have started this literature with, with the study and then several others have picked up on what is called pre pre preparing a profile of vulnerability. The profile is identifying the regions and populations which are most vulnerable also economic sector which are very highly vulnerable, agriculture, fishing for instance, especially in the coastal zones of India. Then there are also coping and adaptation capacities, adaptive capacity of populations and regions. We look at both uh, through the socio-economic survey as well as through digitally elevated model DEM etcetera. We identify the risk and risk accumulation as well as the nature of the disasters in each of this. So, all this we try to say how exactly determines the risk associated with disaster. Now, I mentioned to you about changes in climate extreme and the impact etcetera and then impacts on natural physical uh, environment. So, this is by and large looked at in terms of there are several scientists in India are uh, you know working on this looking at weather and climate events related to disasters is documented very well over the years across different locations in India. They also document you know uh, activities like extreme events and the impacts of extreme events etcetera that is the magnitude of extreme events, how much the damage they have caused. They talk about changing landscape which is also very important. Here I would like to say in one of the studies we found out that uh, you know what they show if you have anybody has seen this video of uh, made by Nicholas Stern, Sir Nicholas Stern, Stern review of uh, climate change they said you know on especially on the east coast of India in Odisha, changing landscape is definitely there because there is according to the uh, you know uh, 2001 census all the villages exist intact. We went by the report 2008 when we visited we found that there are 7 villages in one district Kendrapara are completely missing. When we asked the local people where, where these villages are they said they showed us water it is all inundated in water. The district collector had no clue that this villages have gone you know inundated by water. So, we asked them where this village is, he said they should be there, you must have missed it. And then we tried to figure out where these people have migrated, where have they gone, have they all got wiped out. So, they all spread all over. So, there is changing landscape that is also taking place with climate change that we need to be definitely aware of. Then what are the causes behind these changes? That is also something that is now well documented. And are they short term or long term? How do we act? Because how do we act for short term and long term do differ. So, that is also something that we always sort of think about and try to establish. Having said this, we also try to see what are the changes in the impacts of climate events. Once you identify the changes in climate event itself, then you look at the impact of changes in the impacts of climate events. First change that we notice is in terms of human systems and ecosystems, both source of livelihood, how people live, where do they live, pakka versus kacha housing, several other aspects and changes in the ecosystems also, the depletion of mangroves and others. Then role of extremes in natural and social economic systems, 
how exactly it's affecting. Is it affecting, is it making families more and more nuclear? Or is it really making the more and more joint family? Is the extreme even playing a role? We had looked into several of these dimensions over, over the years in research. Impacts in relation to hazards, is it just simply impact or is it also how do you relate it to you know, hazards that they are exposed to, etc. And system exposure and vulnerability and sectoral vulnerability are some of the dimensions that we have sort of looked into in the disaster reduction. Next dimension that we try to look at it in terms of how do people manage the risk from climate related extreme events at the local level. So there we try to say one is the entire community comes together and then brings in what is called community level coping strategies, community coping. So whole community becomes one and then they try to see how exactly they can cope with it. Some, some of the literature also points out about people trying to migrate to other regions. Sometimes they migrate, the whole family migrates or only one member of the family migrates in pursuit of some employment opportunity elsewhere. And people, so these households are survived based on the remittances. There are community based uh, disaster risk management practices that is also fairly well known in India, different regions, in different locations people have come up with it. How do different communities cope with say, tsunami for instance in the, on the coast of Tamil Nadu? So we will document that now. There are also differences in terms of managing risk with respect to each of the variables like gender, age, wealth, entitlements and the like where they differ. So obviously those who are better off are able to take care of themselves better. There are also social transfers that have been taking place. Microfinance has played a very important role in helping people, especially in restoring their source of livelihoods. And we are also now coming to a situation where we can sort of make people transfer risk. Risk transfer is by and large done to insurance. So the risk is now taken by the insurance company and not by the, especially risk with respect to natural hazards. Then the, we, there are some studies have also estimated costs of managing extreme risk which is not very low. So we did a study of cost of managing extreme risk, especially with respect to the deluge in Mumbai in 2006. I will also present to you briefly what exactly the estimates show. So the next aspect is managing the risk from climate extremes at the national level. So one is the local level, next is the national level. When it comes to country as a whole, we try to document what are the practices, methods and tools used in the length and breadth of the country and document the best practices so that others can equally learn from it. It is also important that the planning commission or planning and policies really take this into account. There are institutions, legislations and finance all earmarked for it. There is climate finance available. Also legislations are being promulgated and institutions are created to take care of this. My Ministry of Environment and Forest has recently been renamed as Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. It has also created a number of institutions which can trigger into this. And the links between the national and local state, uh, local scales as well as costs are all estimated now, all that are being measured. Now apart from local and, and, the, and the national level, the managing the risk at the international level also started and integration across scales have also been taking place. That is why these UNFCC, IPCC meetings are all important uh, where every nation gets represented for interaction. So the policy frameworks and humanitarian institutions are all there at play. What happened, how did they respond to when there was an earthquake in Nepal, for example, Kathmandu. International law and finance also address the issues of climate induced related disasters now. There are technology cooperation and risk transfer that take place across nations. And there is also perspective on links between local, national and global which is also really changing. So people are learning from each other's experience as well as from around the world. So everyone is now working towards a sustainable and resilient future. So it is in this context that disaster risk reduction has assumed a lot of importance. So disaster management team is very popular, very strong, really required. Disaster risk reduction is again a team that really works on that. People also try to talk about adaptation, documenting as well as informing people about various adaptation practices that can be done to cope with extreme events. What is happening here is we have been having development planning for a long time. Coping and long term adaptation have really got into the planning exercise only recently. 
but at least they made entry into that. So, therefore, development planning should also take into account these dimensions which are not really taken for a long time. So, eventually managing long term risk becomes the responsibility of society at large as well as of the policy maker. So, that is exactly where we sort of uh, go ahead in doing this. Now, question is, is this really an issue? How serious is this issue? And where is this issue being done, etc.? In most of the forums now, we say this is a development issue. It is not new, it is not fresh, it is not coming from elsewhere. It is a part of your development issue. Like the way you have problems of poverty and unemployment, disaster risk reduction as well as vulnerability adaptation are all part of the development issue. It is also an equity issue because what happens here is poor women and men in developing countries are the worst affected by climate change as several researchers have pointed out. Although they are not, they are least responsible for causing it. That is why it is important that you, the burden is felt by people who have not caused it and those who are causing it escape without feeling the burden of it. So, the impacts of climate change are therefore, already having an impact on women and men living in poverty, undermining life, livelihoods and increasing weather related disasters. And this trend will get worse over a period of time if it is not attended to. So, climate is changing, climate change is under undermining the sustainability of livelihood and climate change is overwhelming the natural resources on which livelihoods depend upon and climate change is also increasing climate related disaster risk. So, that is why it is important that most countries accept it, understand it and then try to see how exactly what they can do to, to it, look at it. So, let me pose a few questions based on the research that we have undertaken so far. The first among them being, what do you mean by vulnerability? Who are the people who are vulnerable? Those who depend on climate sensitive resources and ecosystem for the livelihood like agriculture, fisheries, etcetera are the people who are said to be more and more vulnerable. Because any climate related changes that take place, it disturbs their production trading pattern. Now, it also deserves those who live on marginalized and hazard prone areas, deforested hillsides, flood plains, flood plains, urban slums and all the people we need to we worry about what happens to them when there is climate change. Thirdly, those with limited assets and political voice, limited political voice to enable them to respond to the impacts of climate change also end up in having low adapted capacity and therefore, they are all the people who are highly vulnerable. So, many studies have shown that these are the people who are highly vulnerable. So, something needs to be done to take care of them. So, already there is a problem of poverty. Now, with further exposure to the hazards of induced by climate change, they were there, they become highly vulnerable. And if they do become highly vulnerable, then it becomes much more difficult to bring them about the poverty line. So, Oxfam has given sort of a framework which could possibly be used to understand. So, this is a very interesting uh, scheme that is why I thought I will share this with you, where they talk about you know how exactly we can address how do we are the issues of climate change. We talk about how do we build adaptive capacity, how is the vulnerability measured and what kind of circle. So, it is a sort of a vicious circle in which we are caught in. So, one can move in the direction in which the arrow is shown. So, in order to sort of cope with it. Now, now I will come to number of the uh, number of case studies that we carried out and the insights that we drawn from this. The first of the study we started in 2002 and then go and went around the country. So, in the first study we tried to say that we are looking at which are the identify the regions which are highly vulnerable and the kinds of settlements which are highly vulnerable. So, vulnerable regions and you know types of settlement that uh, are there in the country. We started by looking at the entire coast of India that is from Gujarat to West Bengal at the district level. So, what we find here is there is experience with the extremes as well as specific disaster risk reduction strategy in each of this we try to document that. Now, we were interested first in identifying the most vulnerable districts of India. So, we thought we look at the 
entire India was stunned by us first, then we found that the East Coast in India is more vulnerable than the West Coast. So this was an exhaustive study, we did only of the East Coast and identified the most vulnerable districts of the Eastern Coast of India. It was carried out by me jointly with one of my PhD scholars, Unmesh Patnaik, in 2007. The results show that, uh, showed that creation of an index which, create, uh, which uh, takes into account the socio-economic as well as climate factors, we introduced, uh, you know, we came up with a composite index of measuring vulnerability, which is very widely used. We are glad that we created this index, very widely used, of course, by several researchers. And with that index, using that index, we were able to identify the most vulnerable districts in terms of risk on the east coast of India. We did not leave it there. If you want, I can tell you the three most, uh, you know, east coast districts which are highly vulnerable were Kendrapara in Orissa, Nellur in Andhra Pradesh and Nagapatnam in Tamil Nadu, among many others that we sort of uh, surveyed. We continued to look at, you know, the, to investigate the disaster due to floods and draws and then, you know, came up with this paper in 2010, where the results show that different cropping strategies found for flood and drought affected households, farmers already changed out to different crops and adaptation strategies depend on the geographical region of the household. Now, what do you mean by this? Here, this study was based on East Gorakhpur district of Uttar Pradesh. And then we did some household survey of people living in regions which are either drought prone or flood prone. Same regions which are, which re receive these extreme events. So we documented, we narrated and also using the recall method, we asked people how they cope with it. We find that those who are near the water bodies in flood prone areas have different adaptation strategies than those who live a little far away. But when it comes to drought, it's a completely different story. And one of the most important adaptation strategies that several of them have commonly adopted is by sending a person in the family to outside in pursuit of employment. So they hedge against the risk of you know, climate related events through remittances from the member from outside the location. Can all families do it? How exactly, how significant is this, etc. is highly debatable. But that's exactly how they cope with it. Because of very poor support that they receive from local government there. In another study, we found that we looked at the loss and impacts of flood in Odisha, uh, where we talked about, you know, what happens here uh, with respect to the sea level rise, etc. We find higher losses recorded for households below poverty levels. We documented that. This is for India's national communication to the UNFCC that we prepared. We also said, based on household survey as well as macro data in that region, and we also identified the losers are higher, losses are higher for households having kacha rather than paka houses. And it is the education status of the household that help their reduce their vulnerability. So how education plays a very important role. We I compared families which have relatively better educated members than others and documented. We did a survey of households across number of villages in the region and found that those families where they have well-educated members, not necessarily the head of the family, but also other members who have been able to adapt to climate related events better than those who are less educated. Then we went, we extended our survey and then wanted to look at some of the health impacts of climate change. Now, when you try, try to, this is carried out by, uh, you know, me in, in, in collaboration with one of my PhD scholars, Santosh Kumar uh, Sahu, and then we published this also, where this, we found that there is a significant difference between the health and income inequality among sample households, you know, collected over a number of villages in this particular district of Kendrapara. So we find that climate related disasters badly affect the health status and hence on employment and income generation activities of the people. Not many studies have really documented the loss of revenue, loss in revenue to the households because of the health impact, adverse health impacts of climate change because they are scared that this, this may go up to a phenomenal number. What we also noticed that income from migration was a very helpful way through which households are able to cope on even the health hazards. So that is something that we need to definitely take note of. Then we move into the study that we carried out in Mumbai. Initially, 
OECD uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development did a survey uh, and then they took data from the insurance companies and then estimated the loss due to deluge in Mumbai. We were invited to listen to the presentation and comment on it. When I gave some inputs, I said, look, this can't be done this way. What happened is most of the losses that they estimated were based on data given by the insurance companies. But since we have been living in Mumbai for a long time, we know that and I particularly those days of you know staying in deluge in Mumbai, we know that you know which are the colonies, which are the wars, which are worst affected. The BMC has documented the streets and roads which are in which were inundated by water for you know a number of hours. So we basically said, uh, you know, we also know that around this region there are several urban informal sector that are mushroomed. Many people have got their own household based enterprises. So who, have, who would have definitely lost their belongings, especially the lively source of livelihood. How are they managing? Because there is no insurance for them. Urban informal sector or unorganized sector. So we said, look, we, are, we cannot really talk in terms of calculating loss only based on what the insurance data gives. So they said, why don't you do this study? So we started uh, looking at this and we surveyed large number of households and cottage in, a, in, a, in a small industries in this region. And now what we first found was the estimated losses from this is much higher than what uh, the insurance companies have given. The figures cost difference was more than 1000 crores. That was very alarming for them. What we found also the social sector in these regions, especially among the have nots, is very highly vulnerable. Informal sector is very badly damaged, most of the activities were informal sectors, etc. But one good thing among all this is most of these enterprises have some studies have also documented, we have also reiterated this, follow what is called Japanese style of management or just in time production. As a result, they do not really keep large inventories. Why do they not do it? They only collect the inputs that is required for one days or two days of production. Do it and then deliver, then only they bring the next lot. Why do they do that? Because space constraint. They cannot afford to pay rent for you know large factories. So most of them are having enterprises within the house or is in the you know within the premise of the household. Such informal activity, uh, you know, which which is which has really mushroomed pretty well, using just in time production of uh, what Tokyo uh, Toyota has taught the world, has really helped them to cope with it because the losses are only to the tune of one and a half days of uh, input or output. Of course, the biggest loss is in terms of machinery if they are inundated in water for a long time. So these are all mostly informal sector activity, very badly damaged, but still how long does it take for them to cope with it. We did the estimation and then try to find out how long will it take for them to come back to business as usual before deluge. The average time if it take across all the sectors, all the economic activities in the region was about 18 months. 18 months time that is one and a half years it will take for them to come back to where they were a day before the deluge. Nowhere this was documented before our study came into being. That's, this is the kind of insight that we are supposed to bring in and tell the government, look, these are the people who need your support the most. Microfinance organizations are willing to come forward to support them after we uh, publish this uh, report. So loss of employment, health asset and loss of household assets are all part of the losses that they suffered. And of course, there are also losses to public infrastructure. Most of the studies, most of the cases that I mean, some of it what I put up, I have not given any share with you all the studies, but some relevant to disaster is what I have given you here. Most successful risk reduction measures are most successful when they involve the direct participation of the people most likely to be exposed to assets. A top down approach does not work. When do you start involving them? Not only at this time of implementation, but in this time of planning itself in planning, in decision making and operationalizing. Give them the responsibility, see how exactly it works very well. 
It's also disaster measures, reduction measures work pretty well when the local leaders drawn from political, social, economic actors of society need to assume a primary responsibility for the protection of their own community. All of them have to play an important role. They cannot say it is government job and not my job. The involvement of local residents in protecting their own resources is possible and can work if sufficient attention and investment is devoted to it. That's where we need to sort of respect the people to say. We also find the disaster reduction is more effective at the community level if specific local needs to be met. Where specific local needs to be met. Can't again, it has to basically community level based when all the in the area is badly affected. So government and institutional interventions often prove to be insufficient and frequently are seen to be sporadic and only responded to crisis. Because it is not simply crisis management, it is not simply that we wake up only when there is a crisis. It is important that we sort of, you know, as I said right at the beginning, prevention is better than cure. So, we be prepared, we foresee what exactly can happen, and where it can happen, can't we really come prepared. I think the hats off to ISRO satellite for the first time that country could face A big, you know, um, tornado that caused Vizag Coast last year, when they uh, migrated people from the region, livestock are also saved to a large extent. Loss to physical property can always be, you know, uh, corrected over a period of time. So what we are trying to say, therefore, say a top-down approach is inclined to ignore local perceptions and needs, and it won't work people will not participate, people will not cooperate with you. It also underestimates the potential value of local research and capacities in the process, local resources and capacities in the process. How to use the local resources, how to put them in place, that can be done only when you plan from bottom up. As a result, it is not surprising that emergency relief assistance for far exceeds the resources invested to develop local disaster risk reduction capabilities. That is why the demand for such reliefs are always very high and therefore the government also ends up in spending more and more relief because you are not really equipping people to be prepared to such extreme events. Now specifically what we have noticed that there are instances of community based risk management. So it is important that this we help them to develop indicators for forecasting and warning based on rainfall, water level relationship of upstream and downstream gauging stations, etc. Locals used to be trained to develop flood hazard maps based on actual observations and communities must be aware of the importance of disaster reduction from their own, for their own well-being. It then becomes necessary to identify the, and impart essential skills that can translate risk awareness up to concrete factors of sustained risk management. So, provide public information and education. It will go a long way to help people cope with extreme events. So, an approach needs to be developed to act, uh, develop activities that can strengthen communities' capacity to identify and cope with others and more broadly to improve residents' uh, you know, livelihoods, etc. That has worked across several uh, things. So, I basically wanted to, you know, in this disaster resolution, I thought I will just share with you some of the thoughts they had and also based on the research that one has carried out over a period of time. So, again, thank you for the uh, attention and what I want to spend the remaining uh, time is basically to uh, sort of interact with you on what you think are the difficulties that you may face in teaching this course with the students, specifically on that because there can always be, you know, discussion and debates and disagreements on some of the uh, steps or methods or policy interventions, etc. But let us, can we now, since the whole idea is also to sort of, you know, together come uh, forward to propose a model, how exactly we can teach this course to our students. So, if there are specific points that you want to talk about, about, you know, difficulties that you may, you may, you already know that you are facing or you may be facing, if you want to pose, I will be very happy to take it up for discussion to start with. What are the current, uh, current uh, policies available for controlling the uh, industrial waste? 
Oh, there are plenty. There are plenty of environmental policies that we have with respect to emission norms, with respect to a right from the beginning of you know uh, setting up the plant uh, till management of waste, hazardous waste, etc. We have Ministry of Environment and Forests and Central Pollution Control Board will give you details of all these policies. There are plenty. It won't be possible to cover all these policies in one course, even one course. So there are plenty. Sir, are they sufficient to control the environmental waste? Well, I don't think there's a you know a, a positive of policy measures in India. It's all uh, uh, the policy measures. Of course, we'll have to keep um, modifying, keep modified, and uh, change to changing requirements and uh, situations. But the problem, most important problem we are facing, is in terms of implementation. That's where the bottleneck is. Thank coming. you, sir. Yes, sir, I want a clarification over how politics contributes towards environmental economics and what role it plays practically to improvise the degrading environmental scenario. Well, unfortunately, politics plays a very important role all over the world, not only in India. So, political will is definitely important. But I always believe that if we can make it, if the, you know, if we can uh, put in some economic sense into the policy making, policy makers, they may also relent, they may also give say a space and then they also will accept the need for it. So whenever we are doing cost benefit analysis for software project development, yeah. generally we have to take care of the environmental pollution, but we don't take care of it. So is there any law or something that we should care of it, take care of it? Cost benefit analysis, we are just uh, calculating the profit and if the project is profit wise okay, then we accept it and do it. But if it is having some uh, environmental hazards we don't take care of it so that that is my question i agree actually cost benefit by definition does not take into account uh, environmental aspects unless it is specified so that is why may, may, may you know the governments are now insisting on environmental clearance where it is mandatory to do a environmental audit or environmental impact assessment environmental and social impact assessment so this data is getting translated into cost benefit analysis then you come back with the social cost benefit analysis. So that is also getting redefined now. It's not simply cost benefit. Simple cost benefit is done for any investment project also. So uh, any portfolio management as well. So what we are therefore now redefining and already several countries are doing is social cost benefit analysis. Okay. Many times in your slides you have talked about the vulnerability. So I want to know. Uh, in what way we have assessed this vulnerability due to the disaster? How you have calculated this? Is there any matrix or what method you have employed actually? We have developed an index. So if you are you know interested in looking at it, you know it's already there in public domain, an institute for development studies in uh, Sussex. They have put it up in their website. Our uh, the index that we have developed. So this index was prepared based on. Uh, the Human Development Index proposed by Anand and Amartya Sen and following that we prepared an index of vulnerability. So we construct this index taking into account the climate related variables alongside the socio-economic parameters. So we compare regions at the village level or you know block level or uh, district level based on the uh, vulnerability index. And on this, we also try to superimpose the digitally elevated model, DEM, in order to understand whether this vulnerability itself is because of the location factor. We must take care of abating all sorts of pollution, such as air pollution, water pollution, noise pollution. But uh, considering the economy of our country, which pollution should be even more important and should be cut? Well, it, you uh, know, uh, it varies from place to place, no, because the places near tanneries are all where water pollution should be given utmost importance. In Delhi today, the problem is air pollution. So, wherever the magnitude of problem is very high, we choose to attack that in that particular region. So, we can't have one size fits all. So, it has to be location specific. The second question is, uh, because India is a poor country, we must develop. And if we go, want to <laughs> develop, then we have to destroy the nature and it will be to a very large extent also. So in the long run, do you think that ultimately we will have to 
depend on the gene mutation and for the survival of the human race sir i i don't i don't i don't know why how you got this impression that development can take place only at the cost of destroying the environment the entire attempt i have made in the last couple of hours is to tell you that it is possible to achieve development without destroying the environment we use the environment but we don't destroy it so it need not really be ex ex it need not be extinct we can, it all depends on how optimally we use it for the right purpose so how can you reduce the risk uh, that uh, disaster risk posed by climate change which on agriculture with changing pattern of climate changes in uh, land use pattern changes in cropping pattern are some of the uh, thing that are already been used by our farmers we are nobody to say anything more they are already adapting it and it's important that we also try to bring in crop insurance so that their their this the the risk is getting reduced through insurance so one more question sir Go sir ahead. how can we reduce the vulnerability uh, that is caused by changing climate uh, to our agriculture production yeah so that's what i mean even changing agriculture production is by and large we try to reduce is by uh, you know uh, uh, crop rotation for example is one method that people have used in number of countries so agriculture gets exposed to crop rotation because this is not agriculture itself is become vulnerable is people who are dependent on agriculture are becoming more and more vulnerable Uh, sir our college is situated in mathura district here the entire economy primarily that is dependent on the pilgrim the entire economy of the uh, district is dependent upon the pilgrim so pilgrim that is increasing day by day that is going beyond the carrying capacity of the place and simultaneously economy is rising but it is uh, definitely hampering the environment of the place that is the degradation of the ponds or the ghats or the entire because a lot of deforestation and urbanization is uh, taking place here so can you sir comment or suggest how to attain a balance uh, between the economy and the environment for a place like where the pilgrims are the major component in this uh, thing i understand and completely sympathize with you madam about the problems that you are facing in mathura i can definitely visualize because uh, you know i uh, i came across similar situation with uh, when i visited bhu recently what i mean i can imagine what kind of problem that they may be facing facing etc now uh, so there is that's a trade off that actually we are talking about that is expansion of economic activity should, can that take place only at the cost of degradation of the environment should it take place only at the cost of degradation of the environment is a question that we constantly ask ourselves but the answer to that is it is possible for us to restrict the degradation that takes place to environment when the economic activity expands but how do we do it sitting in mumbai i will not be able to give you a prescription but it's important that you involve your students in say doing a project and identifying a solution for that and then take it up with the district administration and see where to how to implement it etc i think if we as faculty members and students work together in coming up with an action plan the people in the government cannot ignore our voices but our study should be scientifically based how to continue the economic activity along with it i understand when in a place like uh, you know is a pilgrim place like mathura where most people come here for a, for a day or so and then they may not really bother about the environment in that region and uh, you may not have some of the best practices already there so with too many people coming into that location it does disturb uh, the situation so i mean uh, one while you are talking about carrying capacity uh, etc i don't know whether what is the carrying capacity how much whether we already reached that etc it's very difficult to sort of uh, you know uh, uh, comment without doing a scientific analysis that's why i'm saying that please i i agree with you 
you must involve you are, my suggestion to you is you must involve your students to carry out a joint study and then make the document available to the government so that they will be able to do something about it. Anything that based on scientific insights only will get a hearing today, although it will become more a opinion rather than scientifically carried out research. I hope I have tried to explain to you what my question on that is. Well, my question is that uh, we are talking many things about sustainability. But uh, is it practically possible uh, because we are degrading to air, water and soil. So, is it practically possible or not? Of course, it's possible. How so? How? What's your question? How? I want to know sir, how. Because, uh, because we are degrading to the environment and uh, its speed is very high. Uh, we are degrading to air, water, soil, all the things. And uh, on, other, on another side, we are talking about sustainability. So both are contrasting. No, it is it is alarming, it is uh, disturbing. But if we give up hope, then who will have hopes for the country? So therefore, we'll have to have hopes, and so that we can also in, you know install hopes in our students and say how exactly it can be rectified. So that's exactly what the challenge lies. The challenge faced in you know people in different parts of the country are very different. It is a global problem, sir. And uh, it is you know, in our country also we are. Very I think in developing countries it is uh, making more problem because the industrial development is going high, and uh, uh, in developed country it is already there. But now in developing countries also it is uh, accelerated. So now here also problem is created. No, if you heard me correctly earlier, yesterday I said there is a problem in developing country, but we can also use this as an opportunity to correct ourselves and don't have to follow the path of developed countries and land up in the same soup that they have ended up in today. So there is a lot of opportunity for us to do, learn from their experience and make sure that we don't commit the same mistakes that they committed. So I am very hopeful that if we are open about learning, we will be able to learn and do. Yeah. My question is that, sir, what kind of prevention should be there while disaster management is to be done? Well, disaster management, you know, see for example, let me give an example. Uh, did you look at what has happened in Kathmandu? You know, fortunately, you know, some colleagues were there in Tribune University around the same time when the earthquake was taking place. The university buildings have remained intact. They are all shaken, but nothing has happened. Now, if you are in Japan, you know that earthquake is going to be frequent. So, you have to make your building earthquake prone. So, accordingly you have to act, that is the most important thing. Low lying areas, if you construct houses and then say tsunami has taken away my house, it is bound to happen, is not it? Sea level rise has got my houses inundated, it is bound to happen. Therefore, we have to, I mean there is no one, you know, particular, we have to be prepared and plan accordingly in order to, so we have to anticipate. Accuracy in anticipation and implementation is what we have to learn from Japan. The best country I have seen around is best practice is mostly in Japan. Sir, uh, how to think about the tsunami when it comes and how to take uh, the measures to cope up with it? I don't think we should stand and think about tsunami when tsunami is there. We should run to save ourselves. Okay, no, in a lighter vein. Now, what I am saying is, it is important, you know, I do not think it will be, be possible for us to forecast or plan for tsunami. But at the same time, the way we sort of coped with, uh, you know, Vizag last year, should open our eyes and then say that it is, we have shown that it is possible for us to predict and then uh, take care of our own people as well as livestock. Uh, sir, we have been producing lots of products and services, so my question is, uh, do we have any environmental policy that can promise uh, any eco label on those uh, services and products so that we can enjoy those com commodities without any concern? Yes, we have green labeling. 
we have system of green labeling which is insisted upon mostly for exports but high time we also start demanding green labeling for those commodities sold in the local market uh, sir uh, as you are talking regarding uh, disaster risk reduction so i want to share one thing regarding disaster risk reduction so one of our students of disaster management he had done a beautiful project on uh, tsunami uh, disaster risk assessment uh, how to identify the areas which are uh, mostly vulnerable to uh, the tsunami hazard instead of uh, concentrating upon the uh, reactive and uh, post tsunami effects he had concentrated upon socio economic impacts of uh, uh, tsunami uh, mostly in the uh, eastern coast region of uh, uh, india so andhra pradesh tamil nadu and uh, orissa this this west bengal so mainly these four states uh, this i want to share with you sir and uh, another uh, one question uh, for, from my side sir can i proceed with my question sir yeah please go ahead yes sir uh, question is uh, uh, we are having so many uh, disaster risk reduction schemes and uh, if we see the cbri and uh, uh, central building research institute what we have in iit roorkee one center is there so so we have so many uh, soil uh, engineering techniques or so many bioengineering techniques and uh, environmental related techniques uh, to stop this or to uh, mitigate this uh, disasters but really whether uh, on real grounds how how effectively this these things are uh, taken care how communicated to the uh, low level peoples i mean uh, what do you say the most affected most vulnerable people good this is what my question okay is. okay no i I'm, i'm very glad to know about your students uh, research so i would uh, you know request you to encourage him to publish the work so that you know people can read and become aware of you know uh, how one can go about doing research in this area now coming to uh, you know uh, i'll be very glad to read you know if you want to send it now uh, coming to uh, how to communicate i think it's very important that we make the information available in all the languages of india it is not simply only in english or hindi it should be made available in languages so that which people can read wherever we succeeded whether it is andhra pradesh or tamil nadu or gujarat is is only where we have communicated to people using mobile phones radio through the local language that improve the confidence of the people in your public address system communication system how you just do look at how we succeeded in rescuing saving people in vizag last year only because of the communication network yes sir so well, my, my question, question is my my perspective is so actually in uh, india whatever we are concentrating upon is uh, mostly on uh, post disaster scenario in the sense uh, recovery and rehabilitation scenarios than uh, prevention and mitigation uh, uh, kind of uh, strategies we are not more into the uh, prevention and mitigation but we are more into uh, rescue and uh, rehabilitation and re recovery kind of uh, things uh, even though we are very effective in uh, uh, recovery and other kinds of things like uh, last time uh, andhra pradesh the cyclone in andhra pradesh and uh, cyclone in odisha so they were uh, most most mostly not no uh, no any uh, what is a uh, life loss but why 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 can't we uh, integrate uh, the, all these things in uh, what do you say uh, in the uh, reduction itself or uh, mitigation techniques itself no see let me answer your first last question for that is you know what happened in uh, orissa and andhra pradesh are examples of our preparedness our preparedness to face it so you cannot say it is exposed even even ex pre is actually we prepared before the event occurred for the first time we succeeded in you know uh, so i would definitely you know uh, thanks to is satellite from isro okay thanks to satellite from isro so one should actually be grateful to isro for that no as far as the mitigation is concerned it's a very very trivial issue 
So, you know, most of us do not want to really commit about, you know, too much about mitigation, uh, because there are a lot of costs attached to mitigation and we are not the only people who are responsible for what is happening. So, therefore, those, you know, there is a debate about who should take the first step there. It is those who have already contributed to the destruction or those who are likely to contribute now. So, that debate is going on. So, mitigation is not easy and therefore, I also do not want to jump into the bandwagon of developed countries want us to commit, I do not want to commit on mitigation. Now, as far as the uh, preparedness is concerned, I completely agree with you. Whatever we have to do in order to, you know, face the challenge, that definitely we are doing. But whatever bit we can do in terms of reducing the anthropogenic uh, impose change, we should definitely try and see what we can do uh, without compromising on our uh, path of development. Yes, sir. Why, why I am speaking that regarding preparedness, you are, you are talking about preparedness that I agree, sir. Why I am talking about mitigation? Why? Because uh, example, we are having a river floodplains areas over here. So, once the flood happens, so uh, what do you say, the governments and all, they will all come into the picture and they will try to uh, safeguard the people, evacuate the people and all. But what do you say, aftermath of the uh, flood, so and again the situation will become uh, uh, this, it will comes to the same state. So all the flat plains and mills will be occupied by this poor people and all. So why can't we have means we, we uh, how in what way we can uh, convert these mitigation strategies into economical strategies so as uh, governments and all of the other NGOs can come forward to uh, uh, take a part in this uh, policy making and how can we make the part of what is it how can we participate uh, make the participation of uh, community in the in the disaster management very very good point there are two points you know one is how do the uh, how do as we as a nation or economy can respond to this in fact if you remember in my presentation i talked about mainstreaming the climate change concerns and adaptation including mitigation dimensions in the development plan itself. So, so far the development plan that we made is largely dealing only with investment decisions, which sector should get how much outlay and how they should grow, where they should be located, etc. It is important that we address the climate change, you know, and environmental concern into the mainstream development plan itself. It, we have to mainstream it. We have been articulating about this for the last 10 years. We have made some intro, 12th five year plan talks about it, but now it has been replaced by Niti Aayog. So, hopefully they will uh, look into that. I again, about community involvement, I said decentralized approach is what we are having for planning. So, the community perception should be definitely taken into account. I, 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 there is no disagreement on that. Uh, sir, my question is on disaster management. Hmm. Is there any relationship between the borewell hmm. and the occurrence of uh, earthquake? Hmm. And my second question is, you have said about the buyer and the consumer. Hmm. Now, the Maggi product has been banned. What kind of procedure is followed before sending products to customers and whether the specimen is taken once in a year or thrice in a year? Well, between borewell and earthquake, I do not think there is any relationship, uh, at least not, I have not come across any uh, relationship, any study which talks about relationship between these two. Oh, sorry, about the companies, no, how frequently they test it before they send it to the market, etc. Well, you have been reading about what Nestle is doing, no? So, they take consumers for granted. I doubt whether some of them even test it. So, that is in terms of meeting the, you know, requirement, food standard and all that. So, there are, you know, established institutions that are supposed to be monitoring and checking all this. So, but we do not really check in terms of the environmental aspect. It is only the process, whether it conforms to the environmental regulation is what we check. That is the role of the regulator. One small comment I want to make to all of you, I, I, I at the beginning said that I am looking forward to some comments or you know opinion from you people about what difficulty you think you will face in teaching this course to the students. At least can we spend the next 5 minutes talking about that. Academically, I am not talking about administratively. What are the academic challenge in you know teaching this course to the students? Uh, sir, uh, it is about carbon credits. So, what is the status of carbon credits in India? Yes, what is the status? 
are we uh, implemented the carbon credit system in our india all india well this, it is sector specific no so carbon credits are available for people to earn but you know it is the trading in this which is what has been affected credits are still given okay so the second question is uh, we have lot of environmental uh, in environmental protection laws mm. in india so are we uh, implementing our laws you know are the governments are enacting those laws in preventing the pollution uh, what is your perception about this no if, if only they are implementing so well then you and i need not have to worry so much no when we talk about the uh, few actions from uh, government of india or uh, government of that particular state uh, when we talk about the industrial development corporation they normally used to select uh, an irrigated area or non irrigated area mm. to develop the industries and all but when we talk about the uh, municipal corporations and all and uh, they go for city development city development programs or city development schemes yeah. they normally select irrigated areas or the uh, 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 farmers agriculture area so what action should be taken from the municipal corporation or uh, uh, state government in this regard to pro uh, pro uh, to prevent or to uh, protect the environment let me give an example uh, you know it's very important that you have raised a very important issue uh so let me give an example of what has happened in uh, say uh, in uh, maharashtra that i'm aware of historically maharashtra you know government uh, through this uh, development administration uh, uh, you know center have been training uh, where the you know local civil servants are trained so through the center they have actually been training people even grand, uh, even uh, you know uh, panchayat presidents grants grant sevaks and others so at that level itself they are trying to imbibe the awareness and knowledge about environment what kind of strategy they need to adopt etc what is often happening here is if you travel around the country you realize that many of them take decision without being aware of what damage it can cause to the environment to the local resources etc so such awareness campaign the extent to which maharashtra government has done i am not sure whether other governments have actually done since i am aware of the maharashtra i am just telling you that uh, this development administration uh, based in pune has been really calling these people regularly and training them so they are updating new sets of people as well i mean old people as well as the, i mean or the uh, the various generations been constantly updated and informed about it that has really helped i gave you the example of decentralized approach to sustainable development the best example i would say is in this these, these two taluks of pune district vela and pondra where they are trying to do, where documented how to go about you know involving the stakeholders and uh, you know planning for, from the bottom up for uh, achieving sustainable development that in, that training is very required for the municipal corporation as well as for the local bodies etc Yes, sir uh, you told whatever is required is okay but we cannot change that law means at present in present scenario anyway sir uh, one more question i have as you suggested in our earlier session that is uh, we need to go for the capital expenditure i mean study of capital expenditure as well as operating expenditures mm -hmm. as far as environment is concerned environmental cost is concerned uh, definitely we can uh, uh, yeah we can uh, Uh, go for the numerical calculation as far as expenditures are concerned mm. or applications are concerned but whenever we talk about the source source side or uh, liability side how to go for measurement of that particular liability means uh, say for an example water nowadays we can measure the water like uh, water meters used to be there and all these things so that can we be, uh, that we can measure but what about the air calculation or uh, measurement of the valuation of that particular air even the uh, nowadays noise pollution is also there so how we can measure the valuation of that particular noise pollution so that we can reflect it in our financial statement so that we can control our the control the environment from the various disasters good point i have already said that if you go back to my slides on sustainable development measurement of green gdp how do we measure air water pollution etc the methods are already in place 
So it is basically, I, I explained in yesterday's class about the methods that are being followed widely across nations in estimating the loss because of this. Okay. In most of these cases, it is the cost of monitoring, cost of administering the decisions which are taken as costs, what you are calling as liability. Whenever we uh, think about the environmental audit, means very well, no, I have seen audit. various environmental audit reports also, yeah, environmental audit reports also, but they are more over qualitative basis and not the quantitative basis. Uh, so, how we can convert that into, yeah. No, no, I, I'm, I don't refer to environmental audit, I am referring to estimation of green GDP, imputed environmental costs. It comes into this. I am not talking about environmental audit, that is a very qualitative report, you are right. I am talking about imputed environmental costs which we calculate in the estimation of green GDP. We discussed that yesterday. We have two questions, sir. Go ahead. One is, uh, uh, we are living in the port of uh, Sahyadri, Sahyadri, Western Ghats, and this condition is favoring for uh, uh, growth of uh, teak wood, uh, rose wood, and uh, as well as sandal wood. Mm. Uh, we suggested farmers to grow this wood, teak wood as well as sandal and uh, rose wood here. But uh, farmers are afraid of growing this. Once they uh, grow this uh, tree, after 10 or 15 years they can harvest that and sell that and get, make money. This is the government rule. Yeah. After 15 years, what is the rule? We don't know. The, that is more vulnerable. That's why uh, the farmers are afraid of this uh, government rules and regulations. Uh, any suggestions for uh, no, this no. question? See, no, no. You, they, see, you must know that uh, you know you must distinguish between guidelines and rules. Government cannot force people to cultivate uh, what they want them to cultivate. They can only give incentives and guidelines. As long as their lands are owned by private people, they will take decision what to cultivate. And let me tell you, our farmers are highly rational in taking decisions. Many studies have shown. We think that they don't know, but they are extremely rational in taking decisions. So, has the soil been tested for it? You have to scientifically, if you scientifically educate them, they will definitely get convinced, come on board. But if you are just saying, saying it because of some vested interest or you know, because of price concern and all that, obviously they won't get carried away. So these rules and are highly vulnerable. As government changes, the rules and regulation also changes. Uh, rules are not vulnerable, but uh, uh, the policies are of course subject to a change with the uh, people at the helm. I don't think even I can help that. Individual perceptions differ, so government's perception also differ, political parties' perception also differ. Therefore, they will definitely change. Okay, thank you all, and uh, enjoyed interacting with you over these five sessions, and uh, we'll again meet during the voluntary session. Thank you so much. Thank you.